Revenue Chat Episode 160. Hey guys, Tony Dierso here, and I have to say thank you. Thanks a million. A million downloads, that is. Go to TonyDurso.com slash TV and read all about the exciting next adventure we have in store for you. That's Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash TV. And once again, thanks a million. This is Revenue Chat Radio with your host, Tony D'Urso, interviewing successful entrepreneurs and giving you actionable advice and insights. Let's rev it up. to Revenue Chat. I'm your host, Tony D'Urso, and I am now on television as the Tony D'Urso TV Show. I broadcast over many platforms, such as Amazon, Apple, Roku, the Voice America TV Network, and others. That's over 100 million screens. You'll see these on my mobile app at TonyDurso.com slash mobile. Click that from your cell. And on this app, you'll see and hear my other weekly talk shows, full of great insight from successful people. So please go ahead and download it at TonyDurso.com slash mobile. Also, stick around to the very end for a little story on something I really love. I wonder what that could be. All right, revenue crew, let's rev it up. Here we go. Today we set the stage for Revenue Chat with Cindy Ashton, getting high-paid speaking gigs. Corporate speaker, strategist, and TV host, Cindy's pretty much done it all in this industry. She works with Broadway directors, Emmy winners, and countless thousands on the stage. And after 20-plus years as a singer-entertainer, she's now the TV host of Cindy Uncorked on E360 TV syndicated worldwide on 186 million screens. I love that. And she's received awards from former President Obama and Queen Elizabeth II for her lifetime of volunteerism. And she's appeared in multiple media, including ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, Inc. Magazine, and now Revenue Chat. (laughs) Cindy, welcome to Revenue Chat. Hey, Tony. I love that I get to be on Revenue Chat with you and get to hang out with all your listeners. It's going to be awesome. Oh, thank you. You know, it's my honor and pleasure to have you here. It's always such a delight to chat with you. I'm almost like an Italian teenager because I just really enjoy (laughs) hanging out with you. Just full disclosure, we've done some martial arts together. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. I've seen her sing on stage and I've seen her on TV. A great presenter and you... You, my Revenue Crew audience, you are going to love this. If you're a public speaker, if you want to be a public speaker, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you are an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, if you want to learn how to present, this lady has got the stuff. Now I have a lot to live up to, darling. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, 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 let's take it this way, Cindy. Now, I know, of course, that you were prepped for stardom if, at the age of three. But, you know, not all people follow a career path presented to them at such an early age. Can you tell us more and also what kept you going on in this industry? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, It was like, since I was like a fetus, I've just known what my soul's purpose is, (laughs) for sure. Um, And I I would say, I mean, I've just known it. I mean, nobody in their right mind would choose entertainment as a field. Some, you know, for years people would be, oh, I love to sing. Should I do it as a profession? I'm like, no, unless you really know it. No, it's a hard profession. Um, (laughs) But for me, I mean, I'm I'm a fighter through and through. I mean, I've always known my purpose. My body had other plans for me, and I was born with heart failure you at a 20% chance of living and the whole left side of my body was structurally damaged and I've had multiple heart surgeries throughout my childhood and I had to have speech therapy to learn to speak, let alone sing. I had to have casts on my legs so my legs would grow up well to learn to walk, let alone dance. And here I've gone on to have this insane career. And so 
when you ask me what keeps me going is the entertainment business is tough, but what keeps me going is when you're born ready to die and you spend your childhood not knowing if you're going to get past your teens, it gives a different meaning to your life and it gives a certain fire that just makes you unstoppable. That is a great word for you right there, unstoppable, because when when you in the audience see her, she just goes on and on and and with such a performance. I can't say enough good stuff about you, Cindy. Oh, thank I, you. I'm one of your fans. Oh, <laughs> you're going to make me blush, darling. <laughs> well, you know, I must say, I've never seen anyone on stage do a cappella the way you did. And it, I still remember it vividly to this day. Really amazing. Anyways, let's go into presentation <laughs> skills, you. please. We're going to... Yes. Okay, so you're not too embarrassed now. Because you have several parts and you really do really well at this. So let's talk about presentation skills. And some people need that to overcome, you know, stage fright. They need to get their confidence. Let's chat about that. Yeah. So I kind of have a very opposite view of the overcoming stage fright kind of a thing. I see a lot of, and again, I think everybody should choose a methodology that works for them. I'm just going to share what my methodology is. I see a lot of training out there, what I call robot training. So people are afraid to speak and then suddenly they're given scripts to be memorized and being told to stand here and pose here and make this gesture and breathe here. And I'm like, is this actually helping with our nerves, making them into a robot and making them so stiff? And maybe some people need that level of like, like maybe they need to be whipped into place. I don't know. But in my opinion, it's about learning to drop into your body as opposed to dropping out of your body. Cause I feel like those other things aren't actually letting you be yourself. And, you know, a lot of the times where why people are afraid to speak is 50% of the time, they're not really sure what they're going to say. So that's the first thing is that there's really two things that really stops people from being able to be able to speak in public and those nerves. And the first half is that they're just not sure of what they're going to say and they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to be embarrassed. So what I tell my speakers and my entrepreneurs and I work with a lot of sales teams is that the key is, is get those talking points out Really understand what the flow of what you're going to say, what your talking points are, and just rehearse them, rehearse them, rehearse them to the point where it feels like walking. Because I see a lot of people, they'll do the first part, they'll write out a script or they'll do their talking points and they'll go through it a couple of times, but then they're still nervous because it's not in their body, they're still in their head. And as long, there's two things here. If there's, if you're, as long as you're in your head, how could you possibly be able to actually communicate with another human being because they're too busy in your brain? But the second thing is, is that then you're going to be even more nervous because you're trying to remember what you're going to say. And I think that this whole concept of rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal is just so underrated in our, in the speaking industry. You know, if you were training to be a prima ballerina or an opera singer, you would know that you would take that one run and that opera that you've got to do and you'd be like, v- okay, let's try that again. <laughs> v- and you literally like will take one measure in a music phrase and you would just work it until you go v- 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 like you you just you just keep working it and working it and working it and what happens with you know until it becomes that it's part of your body you never would get nervous about walking would you no not at all of course cuz you've done it right? so many times now exactly. i have some i have something to say on that please I yes. I've, I'm going to talk. No, I'm just teasing. I love what you say. I can listen to the whole thing, half hour show, just you. You're amazing. I've done a lot of public speaking. I've spoken in front of thousands of people. And one thing I've learned or not learned is when I rehearse a lot, I lose that spontaneity off the cuff. But however, this last speech, I just did a 10 minute speech last week yeah. for a contest. I won speaker. I won the I won the award for best speaker. Of so, course you did. It's on That's my awesome. it's on my YouTube at Tony S D U R S O. And it's 10 minutes. It's about my dad in World War II. And I'm telling you the truth. I don't know what I did different because I did that speech so natural, like I never rehearsed it. And I don't know yet all the prior speeches I've ever done, they would be clumsy and I would get tired of rehearsing. So how can you rehearse something over and over and still when you present it make it so fresh you know this is a really really great question um and what i will say is that 
Oh, there's so many things I want to say, but I have to be succinct. Okay. Well, we'll bring so, you on uh, for another episode later on. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the part of it is, yes, I like people to be off the cuff. And when I say rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, I mean not word for word. I mean just getting yourself really comfortable with what you want to say. That's what I mean. I don't mean that it has to be exactly the same every single time. Please don't do that. Then you're disconnected from who you are and you're trying to be perfect. Um, but yeah, but I find the people who are really, really terrified of speaking, they really need to be doing a lot of rehearsals so they feel really comfortable in what they're going to say because they're so terrified that they're going to be humiliated because of what they're saying. So that's why I asked them to do it. But in terms of being off the cuff, this goes to the second, the other 50% of the reason why people struggle with, you know, public speaking fears is how do you keep it fresh? Well, how you keep it fresh is the same answer to how do you deal with the emotional and mental side of overcoming that fear? And it's really about learning to be in touch with yourself and learning to be more present and more intimate. And I say that because we live in a society where we are afraid of intimacy. And I'm not just talking about in the bedroom, but if you look at a lot of people in a conversation, they're shuffling, their eyes are wandering, they're fidgeting, they're not, like we are not actually as a society taught to breathe into our bodies, slow down and really look and connect with another human being and be really present and be really listening. So how you keep it off the cuff, if you're very rehearsed, Tony, is that if you're present and you're really taking in other people, i.e. your audience or the person you're selling, if you're doing a sales conversation, then you're reacting off of their reactions and that's how you keep it fresh. But what happens with the nerves part of it is that we want to be loved and accepted, but here's the thing, so does the people listening to you. So if we're extending our energy out to those people and letting ourselves be open and vulnerable and present with them, it'll allow them to be more open and vulnerable and reach that energy back out because they want to be seen and loved and heard. And if they're seen and loved and heard, they're going to give that back to you. But if you're on stage and full of nerves and disconnected, they're going to be full of nerves and disconnected. So hopefully that answers both those questions. It does. And I think the one jewel that I got from this, I several jewels, but the one is because when I rehearse a speech, when I give it live, invariably, I miss some part that I really thought was important when I rehearsed. And that happened again this last time. And I was like, <laughs> oh, no. In a half of a nanosecond, I had to decide I'm going to keep going and not add in that. But I, I worked on the audience <laughs> reaction and yes. fed off of that. And that actually, now that you mentioned it, that's what kept me going that was different than my prior public speaking. Yes, yes. Oh, because I like that, Cindy. Thank you. Yes. Now, here's a little solution to your problem. Because you learned to be, because it was your most natural piece, it was because you were dropped in and willing to listen and be present and feed off them. It also makes you sell better without having to do a sales script. But here's the thing, is if there's something really important that must be said, there's nothing wrong with having the podium to the side with a sheet with very large writing on it with not sentences and sentences, but like key little trigger words or trigger images if you're visual. So as you're speaking, you can wander over once in a while or look down if it's on the floor. I don't have good enough eyesight to do that personally. I'm like, when is that? <laughs> but you know, you can have something placed on somewhere on your stage. You can wander every now and then. And if it, and if, and then it will trigger you with that word or two or that image that you missed that part and you can revisit it and say, Oh, okay, I got to go back for a second. I totally forgot to tell you this and make it part of the fun and part of not making yourself wrong, but make it part of the fun. I like that. I like that. And I will remember that when I do long speeches, right? You know, if they're short, I can pretty much remember everything, but if they're long, I will do that. We're all looking for ways to simplify our lives, right? For small businesses, there's the Cabbage Card to help you simplify and cover your expenses in one place. The Cabbage Card is linked to a line of credit of up to $250,000, giving you the flexibility to make purchases with cash, check, or where credit cards are accepted. Apply online and get a quick decision. Cabbage has funded more than $4 billion. They're trusted by over 130,000 businesses, and they're A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. 
Get the security of a line of credit with the convenience of a card. Visit Cabbage, K-A-B-B-A-G-E dot com slash revenue chat and you'll get a hundred dollar gift card when you qualify. That's cabbage with a K dot com slash revenue chat. Credit lines and pricing are subject to periodic review and change. This is not a revolving account. Individual requests for capital are separate installment loans. All Cabbage business loans are issued by Celtic Bank, a Utah chartered industrial bank member FDIC. And we're back with Cindy Ashton getting high paid speaking gigs. And now I listen to a lot of speeches. I watch a lot of speakers and I can tell something really quick when they give a story, I follow it. When they don't give a story, I don't. And not all speakers can do this, but I'd love you to tell us why is storytelling so important to connect with that audience? Yeah. So stories, in addition to prostitution, is the oldest profession in the world. Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you expect anything else from me? Come on. Nope. <laughs> right on. <laughs> I mean, people are, I'm telling you, I am completely Cindy uncorked. I mean, I just say it like it is. But storytelling is is really great because, first of all, if you tell the story in a way that's that's powerful, then what happens is, first of all, in that story, you help people to see um, themselves in that story. When they are able to see themselves in that story, then they feel like they can bond to you and relate to you. So that's part of it. It really brings those emotional anchors. The other reason is that you can have visual anchors. Then you get people into their visual senses and their kinesthetic senses, and then it becomes an experience and not just you barking at them some information. So it's a great way to learn information. It's a great way to emotionally connect. It's a great way for people to relate to you, for them to drop their defenses and bond with you a lot faster and kinesthetically and visually feel what you're feeling. It's so bloody powerful. It is, it is. And I, when I hear a speech and if there's no story, it's, it just doesn't hold my attention. And if you listen to my speech that I just mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll send you the link as well and I'll put it in the show notes for the audience. Because I not only told the story, but I acted out part of it as best as possible. And it was just, I never had such great audience participation. And after the speech, it was amazing. Every person was touched. One lady was actually crying. It was like, right. wow, wow. So, but I'm not going to say more about that. We're going to talk about <laughs> speaking and I love it. we're going to talk about speaking here. And I know some people struggle and I know some people really want to get speaking gigs and you have an amazing agency. I've we're sent some people to you and every single one has said, how professional you are and your company and how great it is to work. It's just amazing. 100% accolades across. And, and I'd like you to tell our audience here about your booking agency and how you help people speak, you know, get speaking Yeah. Things. Yeah. So let me kind of back it up around where the challenges are with getting speaking engagements and what people need to be able to do to do that. Sure. That's that's the first thing. And then we can talk about my booking agency. Of course, I love talking about that. And Tony, thank you for all the referrals. I mean, your your clients are amazing. And um, all the clients you referred us, actually, that we represent have already gotten gigs. And that's in a very oh, short time we represented them. Oh, that's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And they're all beautifully high paid gigs, which is lovely. Um, really exciting. So... Um, when it comes to the speaking world, it's really challenging. And that's because I feel like the education of what speakers are all about is just not even out there. And the first thing that somebody needs to do as a speaker is really understand what type of speaker they are. Are you a no fee speak to sell speaker, which means you don't get paid, but you're speaking as a way to build brand awareness, sell your products and services, give you visibility? Um, or are you a paid speaker? Now, a lot of people go listening, might go, oh, I want to be a paid speaker. Well, that's wonderful, but what's your topics? Because what people don't realize is that the paid, the high paid, and I'm talking three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 and more, the high paid speaking is specifically for 
corporations, like at the corporate level, as well as trade associations, trade um, industries, that kind of thing. So a lot of people who want to be speakers are like, I need to monetize my speaking, but their topics are around self-help um, or for entrepreneurs. Those markets don't pay. Those conferences just don't. They're the no-fee speak-to-sell conferences, unless it's like a major conference and they're, you know, and at that point you have to be pretty well known as a speaker to get those high pay. And a lot of there's and there's been this trend in the last few years around paying to speak at these events, not even doing it for free, you know, getting, you know, paying to actually be there. So the first thing is you have to understand what type of speaker are you? And if you, you know, so there's a lot of people who say I've overcome abuse, I've overcome divorce, I've overcome cancer, and that's amazing. And you should be really proud of yourself. But how does that relate to corporate? What is your expertise in helping them shift their productivity, their bottom line, their sales, their management style, like their retention levels, all that stuff? You need to be able to, if you want the paid speaking, you have to figure out a way to make your topic sexy for them, to solve a problem for them. So sometimes I find people in the entrepreneurial and the personal development space can do the transition over. And we've certainly, as a booking agency, we've certainly helped our speakers to do that. Some of our speakers have done very well in the entrepreneurial space, and we've been able to reposition them for trades where those trades are like entrepreneurs, like financial services or franchises or network marketers. Those big companies do pay. So that's the first thing. Do you want me to keep going? Oh, or- <laughs> that's great. I'm taking notes. Please, more and more. Oh, yeah. Okay, we, okay. Cindy, so, we uh, all want high paying speaking gigs. Keep I going. <laughs> you, need to make your, you need to make your expertise and your content relevant to corporate and trade associations. Okay. So that's the first step. Then you need to figure out within all of that, within the entrepreneurial space, within the corporate space, whatever your space is, personal development, wellness, whatever. What is your vertical? And everybody kind of goes, who? What does she mean by vertical? <laughs> I remember when I first heard that many years ago, like, huh, what? <laughs> I know. I did the same thing, if, you know, back in the day. So a vertical is essentially your market, your niche. And the reason why you want to know this is because it's much, much easier for you to be able to find speaking engagements if you are fully aware of what the niche is and what the specific problems are in that niche. So because I know myself inside out, literally, um, I'm going to use my, my myself as an example. So let's say even though presentation skills could be spoken about in every possible conference you can ever imagine, right? Unless it's for like climate change or something. Um, You know, (laughs) I wouldn't know what to do about climate change. That's not my expertise, but let's do it, please. Um, So let's just, so let's say that I decide, well, I'm going to do a campaign to get bookings. I'm going to be really efficient. I'm going to choose two verticals or two niches. Let's do attorneys and let's do financial services. So what you would do, all of you, you would decide on the two different verticals that you're going to do. And then you're going to do some research on that vertical to find out the specific problems that they're having that you can solve and in what way. So for example, if I was pitching for financial services, my pitch would be, Only 14% of your industry are women because they hate the male style of selling and all that pushing and 100 calls a day, right? That's the problem. And then I would go on to say, you know, TV personality, like I don't pitch myself anymore. I have a team to do it. But, you know, TV personality and Broadway performer, whatever, right, Um, you know, will teach your advisors how they can you know, be personable and use storytelling as a way to authentically engage their clients. So instead of saying, let me help them overcome the stress of a sales conversation, that doesn't really read, right? But if I was, so I'm very specific about the fact that it's women and there's not very many of them and they need to be able to sell in a way that's not the male style, which is more authentic, conversational, you know, so that's why I'm teaching them storytelling skills and how to be personable. Now, if we look at attorneys, my pitch would be different. My pitch would be, you have great attorneys on staff, but they don't know how to close a sale. And unless they're bringing in prospects, they can't rise up to partner and they can't help you raise up your bottom line. Totally different pitch, but it's the same. It's totally different pitches, but it's kind of the same thing, but I'm repositioning it. So then I would go on to talk about 
about, again, how I'm able to help them with presenting skills so they can go to a networking and be more personable and use storytelling as a way to nurture clients and close them. So my solution is the same thing. I'm teaching the same bloody thing, but I've pitched them completely differently based on the problems that they're having. I got you. And I want to make one thing very clear for our Revenue Crew audience. And that is, again, if you are thinking of speaking, if you are a speaker, if you want to speak or whatever, Cindy, you have a program that actually, to a degree, that takes someone up to the level of professionalism that you need to be able to place them? Yeah. So let's let's kind of talk about that. So there's really two options. There might be people listening that goes, hey, Cindy, I've been speaking for years. I already am an expert in my field. My content is solid. My stage delivery is solid. I've got a track record, but I need to increase my, my bookings or bureaus aren't really doing it for me. I'm just sitting on their list and getting a couple. So if you're already at the professional level, then absolutely go on our website, check out what we do. In a nutshell, we create customized campaigns and give you a team of people to sell you. We give you a dedicated salesperson, a lead generation strategist, a positioning marketing strategist. Like we have an entire team working on your campaign dedicated to you. It's a small monthly fee plus a percentage that we take. And so that, that site, Cindy, is cindyashton.com? Nope. 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 CindyAshton.com is my main website for me, my brand. But um, but thank you for promoting that. That is speakerstardom.com. Speakerstardom.com. But for those of you who are listening going, this is really cool. She kind of knows her stuff around getting these paid bookings and how to pitch. I want to be able to get represented, but I know I need training. Um, then you can go to my other website where I do trainings, and that would be yourpersuasivevoice.com. We, is there one site where people could go to for all of it or? Yeah. I mean, just if so they go to speakerstardom.com, yeah, if it makes it easy, go to speakerstardom.com. There's, you can connect with a part, one of our team and say, I need training. And, and realistically, you would probably fill out an application and we would do an analysis of where you're at, where you need to go. So we have all kinds of tools to help you to figure that out because a lot of people go, you know, a lot of my clients would come to me and they go, Cindy, I'm a really great speaker, but I'm not getting paid to speak. And I'd be like, that's awesome. And then I would look at their platform and I'm like, well, this is really working for you, but this is why you're not getting paid to speak. And they're like, oh, but we don't know what we don't know. It's really hard to assess ourselves. So we actually have an assessment that they can take. There's different, we have different tools. So just go to that website, peruse it, go to the contact page, email, say, hey, I'm interested in training. How do I get an assessment? That kind of thing. Or how do I get booked? All that good stuff. I got it. So I want this firmly impressed in everyone in the Revenue Crew audience in your mind, speakerstardom.com. That is the place to go to find out about speaking, speaking gigs. Also, you can go to cindyashton.com, A-S-H-T-O-N. And by the way, Cindy, at speakerstardom.com, can they actually contact you and ask you a question or say, hey, I heard you on Revenue Chat, blah, 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 with a question? Well, that would go to my team, but if you join our Facebook group, you could be, so if you go, if you're on Facebook, go to speaker start a booking agency, put that in the search box and then join our Facebook group. And then I interact there publicly. Otherwise everything goes through my team. Say that one more time slowly on the Facebook group. Uh, speaker stardom booking agency. If you put that in the chat box or the search box in Facebook, then you can join that group and you can ask me questions and interact personally with me. I love it. Thank you for sharing all that. And one yes. more thing. One yeah. more thing. We got we got we got a minute and a half. We're Italian. Well, <laughs> you're not Italian, but we're I gonna can speak Italian. <laughs> say, you can speak Italian. That's good. I want to hear about your TV show, Cindy and Cork, before we go. And what made you do that? So Take it oh, away, okay. Cindy. So I've got one minute to tell you that Sydney Uncorked is accumulation of my entire life work, where I get to be both the entertainer or performer, as well as the speaker and the person delivering great education. So we are currently, it's a talk show, and we really go into provocative topics. We really like to push boundaries. We like to go deeper on topics, and that's a whole other show with you, Tony. So essentially... Um, if you want to check it out, you can go to Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, put in the app E360 TV, and then you can search my, for my show there, or just go to E360TV.com. My show is there, and you can even watch it from your smart TV. Ooh, ooh la la, sounds great. And I'll be joining you soon on Amazon Fire, Apple, Roku, and others very soon yes. with, with the Tony D'Urso TV show. And I thank you for 
every gold nugget of advice and wisdom you've given me on that, Cindy. I thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome, darling. Lots of love and hugs. And thank you to all of you listening. It's been a joy. Well, all right. Once again, Cindy Ashton talking about getting high paid speaking gigs. And yes, you can really do it. She is taking care of 100% of the people that I've sent her way and they're all super happy. Go to speakerstardom.com. If you get lost, go to cindyashton.com. That's a little joke. Italian (laughs) joke. And I want to thank you again. It was great. And you'll see it all in the show notes. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone. And stay tuned to our next show on Revenue Chat. Stick around in just another moment. I'm going to tell you about something I really love. If you like this interview, would you kindly give me a review on iTunes? It's the purple icon on your Apple device. A sentence or two is just fine. Thanks in advance. Our next episode is with Rob Kessler, inventor of Million Dollar Collar. Hi, Tony here with a quick word about getting you discovered. Do you want a lot of people checking out your sales page, your branding page, your podcast? Like many people, are you just trying to do it all yourself? Or maybe get by with a virtual assistant or two? Are you taking webinars, seminars, and workshops to learn how to grow your social media and how to bring visitors to your site? Or are you downloading free ebooks, buying books, buying classes, doing this and that just to learn how to get more sales, more people, more exposure? We all do. And it isn't all that it's cracked up to be for some, is it? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It takes a lot of training. I've written books on this and I'm helping others get a lot of visitors to their web pages and podcasts. And I mean thousands and thousands every month. Check it out. Go to tonydierso.com slash grow. That's Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash G-R-O-W, tonydierso.com slash grow and get discovered. Here's a story about something I really love. What do I love? Well, as mentioned in the last episode, here's an event that happened a few months later. And just before that, let me get into a refresher. There's a Japanese hunting dog called the Akita, who's one generation away from a wolf. The Akita is a bear hunter. Two of them can hold back a bear. They can stalk and take down animals several times their size. Now let me tell you about the wolf in my dog. His name is Ronan, and I got him at nine weeks, and he was about 30 pounds. Ronan is pure white, and at seven years old, he went up to about 140 pounds. To give you a size comparison, at five years, his red and cream-colored grandfather weighed 150 pounds with a giant head, and he looked like a small lion. Now, Akitas are naturally territorial and aggressive, and they come with one warning. They are natural guard dogs. Don't train them further or you will lose them as a pet forever. Akitas think like a wolf and they will challenge you over and over. If you say no today, they'll come back again and again to test you another day. Well, I put mine through a series of private and group training while also heavily socializing him. It took years to make Ronan realize that he's not the alpha of the family. Like a wolf, He would take the spot the moment you relax. Now, at the time of this story, Ronan had been with five different trainers and he was the most friendly, loving dog anyone had ever seen, even Akita owners. Ronan had dog friends of all sizes. Well, one day before Ronan tore his ACLs, after having a series of five training classes, including advanced obedience school, my wife was walking him down the street. Well, one of our neighbors has four black labs and a hush puppy dog, a basset hound. Our neighbor parked her car on the street and walked into her house carrying groceries. She left the door open while she went back and forth to her car. Her dog pack of five dogs, seeing Ronan, came running out on their own, crossed the street, and went straight for Ronan. Now, Ronan, seeing five dogs running to greet him, was probably quite happy. I wasn't there but I can only imagine that his tail was wagging and that he was thinking he was in for a delight. 
here's five doggies coming to, to say hello, is probably what he was thinking. Unfortunately, that did not happen. The four black labs took him down and bit him up in a few places. Meanwhile, the hush puppy was there to inspect the damage. However, Ronan, with his thick coat, only one bite on his leg drew any blood. With that, Ronan immediately got on his feet and confronted the attackers, realizing now that he had been tricked. It happened so fast that my wife didn't have a chance to do anything. And after all, what could she do? The neighbor quickly came and took her dogs away. Now Ronan was upset and changed. From then on, he became the aggressive Akita. If he didn't know you and you came up close to him, he would bark so loudly that it would hurt your ears, literally. He was now on guard with any dog he saw, especially large ones. He was fine with little dogs, but no longer friends with anything larger than perhaps 30 pounds or so. Ronan changed then and there. All the years of training to socialize him went down the drain. He got defensive with every large dog he saw. Now next, I'm going to tell you about one of the most amazing stories about Ronan's first vacation in our Jeep Wrangler when he met some wolves in the wild. Yes, really. And you won't believe this story. Stay tuned. And by the way, I love my Jeep. And hey, it's a Jeep, not a car. And if you're on my Facebook page at Tony S. D-U-R-S-O, S for Salvadore, Tony S. D-U-R-S-O, you'll see some photos there under my album labeled What I Love. All right, stay tuned for The Wolf and My Dog on the next episode of Revenue Chat. All right, thanks again, everyone. And until next time, remember, you can make life better for yourself and everyone. Choose wisely.